So, hi Lauren. Hello. I've never done this before, so it should be interesting. Um, I'm already nervous, but you're not because you're a pro. <laughs> uh, but so I, I, um, I noticed this when we were sitting in the control van uh, and I asked you a question about features, you immediately started to draw. And that's something I do all the time because I'm a painter and I think with, with my hands. Um, and I often have to explain to people that I think with my hands and it was interesting to see that you thought with your hands as well and every so often you meet someone else who thinks with their hands and so I thought it would be an interesting take on the kind of work you do and as a meeting point to sort of instead of having a face-to-face -face interview that in the normal way to actually do a drawing interview. Sure. How do you think about features in the landscape and uh, what kind of features and how do you use drawing to think about them? Right. Well, one of the big things that I have to do in my job is sort of be able to visualize situations in the past and like environmental conditions or what a landscape looks like. Mm -hmm. And I have to visualize them well enough in a way that if I see them in the real world in, in the data that we collect, mm -hmm. then I can make sort of a match with mm -hmm. the patterns. Mm -hmm. So, and when I'm teaching students, I try to have them make a connection between natural processes that happen mm -hmm. and the products that they create. Mm -hmm. As I work with students and I ask them to draw things, I often am asking them to draw something that is not a still life, right. but more about draw me a concept. It goes from one state to another. Right. And so you're asking them to draw something that sort of has a conceptual motion. It's one exercise I do with students, and this is actually a big theoretical part of archaeology, is to get them to envision the archaeological past but as it occurs today. Because mm -hmm. the way it looks today is not exactly the way it looked in the past. So, right. and what I mean by this is, let's say we have, we're along the edge of a river, and I'm gonna just draw a scene here, and someone has made a plank house. They actually use wooden planks, and they have a top to it. Here, can I interrupt you for a second? What if we move down a little bit so your angle's stronger on it? Yeah. Okay, great. So let's say someone has taken wooden planks, yep. you know, and they make a, a sort of traditional plank house. Yep. And um, outside the plank house, they might have um, a rock ring around a like a warming fire, a cooking fire outside. Okay. Yep. There may be an area where they're disposing shells in this landscape. Yep. Um, there could be. Uh, Underneath the plank house, you could have uh, blocks of rock that are used as foundation materials. Yeah. Okay, so this is maybe how it looked, and we, you know, we would expect, of course, that there are you know, people in this landscape you know, doing different activities. That which remains through time for us to find will be very different than this. And there are, we can think of it as a filter, and um, basically this filter is a whole series of processes that decay wood, that cause um, organic materials to uh, become you know, not preserved in the past. You can get erosion and burial of different kinds of things differentially. So if I was to fast forward to what this would look like in sub-bottom profiler data, so this is the same <coughs> surface, and maybe now we're seeing it underneath a bunch of marine sediment mm -hmm. right here. But we might expect to see these blocks of rock. They're probably not going to go anywhere that were here. And we may, if we're lucky, maybe some of the stones are present. But what's more important with this is the heat of the fire will actually alter oh, the sediments amazing. underneath yeah, it, and, cool. and it'll cause it to have a different signal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the magnetics of that, for example, will be very different. And then um, it may even have a remnant of the shell midden. But it could be that you have an erosional channel that was around the edge, and it chopped some of this off. Mm -hmm. So. This is sort of the version of how we would think about this. Right. So this is there's a big filter, in a sense, that um, is what we call site formation. Site formation processes that take us from the active past right. to the more static present. Right. So as archaeologists, we have to sort of begin to think about you know, don't get fixated. We don't have people that this is all they ever did. It's like, no, this is just the bit that remains. So think beyond and think about that which does not remain. I think it, what it makes me think of the fact that, so most people mostly don't draw, right? They don't have a practice. They look at drawings or they might 
mostly that's not part of their work and, and or their imagine, imagined space. And usually they see the end product. And so a drawing is a static thing. But for us, it's actually, um, it's a process. It's a, it's a thinking process. So the, the, there's a match between um, thinking about processes and actually drawing processes because we are, it's a thing that moves through time. Um, so it makes me think of, uh, you know, how do you, you know, if I, if I start a drawing, I'm really thinking of, um, you know, I'm reacting in real time to build, you know, it might be a still life or it might be um, a representation of these pens. And as I'm moving, I'm actually charting space, but for the person looking, it becomes an object that's static. So I find it, it, there's just an echo for me of what you're talking about, about kind of think, may help asking your students to think about processes and using drawing for that. Like there's a, right. drawing's actually naturally suited to think, think in time. We're right now on Nautilus sailing back to Astoria and you came here with a story that you wanted to investigate mm -hmm. um, and a larger picture. Can you, can you do some drawings about that? I think it'd be great to have a, a sense of sure. that whole scale that comes back. I mean, the connection between this micro scale of an object and then the macro scale of... Right. So we're gonna, we'll start big first and then go to something Whatever closer. Whatever you want to do. Okay, so... All right, now this is not drawn perfectly, but the idea will, will come across. So this is the Pacific Ocean, and this is um, Russia here, and we have Alaska over here. And in between, we normally have a gap. Uh, the Bering Sea is here, but during the last ice age, we actually had a land bridge that existed. And the reason for this is because there were large um, sheets of ice on uh, Canada and uh, this large glacial complex blocked most of what's now Canada during the time period peaking at about 20,000 years ago or so. In the process of doing that, it exposed sort of a thin, not really continuous, but we'll draw it that way, um, bit of land that goes down Oregon's coast. Um, and we went down even into Baja California. There's actually a little bit more down here in California, a little bit. But the point is, is that there was extra coastline that got exposed to, that relates to the ice locking up a lot of the ocean's water. We think that people during the last ice age made their way across the land bridge or along the edge of the coast or in both ways, mm -hmm. and they made their way south. And if, if they came down a coastal route, for example, we should expect to see the earliest sites out here on the edge of the coastline. And we are here working in, um, in this zone, sort of in Oregon, not drawn to scale, but we're working here in, off of Oregon's coast in a place that actually has a large bit of land that would have formed. And here I can move over and we'll, we'll sort of draw from, uh, there's a there's a town up here. We can move called, this over if it's better for you. The town of Newport, and then down here there's another town called. All right. Now this is not drawn perfectly, but the idea will, will come across. So this is the Pacific Ocean, and this is um, Russia here, and we have Alaska over here. And in between, we normally have a gap. Uh, the Bering Sea is here, but during the last ice age, we actually had a land bridge that existed. And the reason for this is because there were large um, sheets of ice on uh, Canada and uh, this large glacial complex blocked most of what's now Canada during the time period peaking at about 20,000 years ago or so. In the process of doing that, it exposed sort of a thin, not really continuous, but we'll draw it that way, um, bit of land that goes down 
Oregon's coast um, and we went down even into Baja California there's actually a little bit more down here in California a little bit but the point is is that there was extra coastline that got exposed to that relates to the ice locking up a lot of the ocean's water we think that people during the last ice age made their way across the land bridge or along the edge of the coast or in both ways mm -hmm. and they made their way south and if if they came down a coastal route for example we should expect to see the earliest sites out here on the edge of the coastline and we are here working in um, in this zone sort of in Oregon not drawn to scale but we're working here in off of Oregon's coast in a place that actually has a large bit of land that would have formed and here I can move over and we'll we'll sort of draw from uh, there's a there's a town up here town of Newport and then down here there's another town called Reedsport and between these two areas there was a pretty significant piece of ground that formed uh, out here and it sort of has this hook shape and this is about so with things like rivers for example you know everyone knows what a river looks like you see it on a map but very few of us have ever been inside a river and seen it from that perspective. So with students, you know, we can begin with something simple like we talk about a meandering stream. Mm -hmm. So as it appears from the air looking down, it might look like this. And yeah. as we drag our geophysical instruments around with a ship like the Nautilus, it's looking into the seafloor. So it's not gonna necessarily show us this shape, especially if it's buried under marine sediments. Mm -hmm. But if our ship is traveling across in this direction, mm -hmm. What it will show us is sort of a flat surface, maybe like the marine deposits on top, and then underneath it, we'll actually begin to see a cross section through the stream. Mm -hmm. And we'll get enough of these in different positions, up and down across, that um, I'll be able to see them as a whole series of shapes that I can then rebuild into a three-dimensional form, so I know that these are, these are going to connect right. and that they'll make, I probably should move this one over, but they'll meander like this. So I always have to sketch these things out sometimes for me to really wrap my mind around it. Mm -hmm. And I always say that I have, when I'm writing a scientific paper about the results, that I need to make the figures, the pictures first. If I can't visualize the pictures, sort of the essential aspects of it, I find it's very difficult for me to write about it because I feel like I don't necessarily understand it unless I've drawn it first. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of like the the stereotypical river trough. What kind of, if you were to go zoom in a little bit to that kind of feature, what, what would you expect to see actually in the landscape with successive river passages? Because a meander will move. Right, exactly. Your whole research is about or at least correct me if I'm wrong, but is about where people will be in that landscape. And so how do you, like if you could talk to us a little bit about the hot spots where you might expect to find people and why, like in a sure. visual space. Well, the concept of a meandering stream, that will leave behind some unique uh, kinds of deposits. So let's begin again with our meander. And let's say it's meandering this way. So it's gonna sort of move around and move around as it progresses, it'll go let's say from north to south across the landscape going back and forth. Mm -hmm. But in the seafloor what this will look like is you'll actually see, you might see a pretty broad cut like this, but inside you may actually see parts of it where it was occupying different areas. Mm -hmm. And so it, this is sort of the first deposit, the second deposit, the third deposit. Okay. So it'll, it'll fill it up and then it might cut and then fill, then it'll cut and fill. Okay. So that's another cross section, we're like an x-ray view into the landscape. Part of the work that we're doing out here too is to try to understand this at bigger landscape scales. So we have, we know where the edge of Oregon is, the modern coastline, and we know there are rivers that go from the land to the sea. Uh -huh. And then what we have been able to do is actually draw where, draw, make maps that show where some of these 
streams are and they actually got the computer to run water across this reconstructed landscape. Very cool. So this out here for example might be where the shoreline was at 20,000 years ago mm -hmm. and we know there are streams that came out onto this exposed landscape. Whoops, I'm drawing them the wrong way. And then... Uh, Sorry, there's a, there's a bluff going down there. Yeah, well, yeah, there's something to explain it. So, and as they go into uh, down all the way to this 20,000 year shoreline, that's just a simple, that's a state of how the environment was at this one time. Mm -hmm. So as we draw, as we bring our equipment back and forth over this, we would expect to see different kinds of patterns like this. We would expect to see sort of a U-shaped thing here and mm -hmm. a U-shaped thing here. What we also have to think about is there are different positions of shorelines through time. And maybe this is at 16,000 years. So if we're trying to find archeological sites that relate to the 16,000 year shoreline, mm -hmm. let's say, I'm interested to go and look at places like this where you have an intersection between a freshwater stream and a saltwater system, so mm -hmm. an, uh, an estuary it's called. And the estuary might actually have a very particular form where you're seeing... Um, so yeah, let's go, let's, let's go in. And so we had talked about some of the forms that you might find as actual artifacts. And could you could you just give us a couple examples of what those forms could be and what they would look like? Maybe, sure. Um, from a bird's eye view and or from a tr from a transect. So if we have, let's say, an estuary with some tributary streams that are coming in, and it eventually goes down to the actual edge of the ocean. Yep. So we have an estuary where salt water and fresh water come together. Yep. What people do sometimes in these situations is they'll actually go and create what are called weirs and the weirs are stone fences or they can do it with sticks so to draw if this is the the bottom of this muddy channel here they'll actually create a rock wall mm -hmm. and they build it up and it goes sort it's of from side to side yeah, okay. and it blocks this mm -hmm. now for at high tide it's no big deal the water's up here and the fish just sort of swim up and over it yeah. But then at low tide, the water comes down and the fish is stuck behind this mm -hmm. fish fence. Mm -hmm. And you can wade in there and scoop them up and club them or get them with a net and it's real easy. Mm -hmm. Another alternative to this is, um, is to basically put sticks in the ground. You have sharpened sticks and the sharpened sticks are at a certain interval depending on the size of fish that you're after. And they will do the same thing. These, this will be easier to see in the geophysical right. signal. This will may not show up at all. Okay. But we could guess that people might be putting them here and we could go and look uh, more carefully. Have you ever found any of these on a dry site where by remnants of actual either fossilized wood or? Right. Yeah, the stick weirs, these exist in coastal streams today. Okay. So you can go to Coos Bay, you can go to Yaquina Bay, and there are many, many of them that are known and they're mapped in by archaeologists. And they move through time, so uh, they, they can take wood samples off of these and get a radiocarbon date, and they can tell you the age and how they mm -hmm. are uh, used in the landscape. So uh, if I was to, uh, also I would expect in an environment like this, closer to the shore where maybe there are some rocky areas mm -hmm. like this, I would expect that people are going to be accessing the beach at low tide, coming up into some place up, up here, maybe creating what we call a shell midden. Mm -hmm. And shell middens are just piles of shell that can be used for lots of reasons. They Sometimes they're just disposal areas or other times you can incorporate the shell into the ground around where you have other structures to sort of keep the ground from being muddy. In the geophysical data, what we would expect to see with something like a midden, if we're running across the landscape and we find we find the channel and then the channel goes down and up mm -hmm. again, we would expect to see something that has a harder refle a reflector signal for the acoustics. Yep. And that could be this shell midden right okay. in here. It could also be um, rocks on the edge of a point bar on the edge of the stream and we would not be able to really tell the difference right. from the geophysics but 
if we had a, a view down like this and we see that it only occurs here um, and then maybe there are other ones that we suspect could be gravels but they're in different positions right. you can always just run a core into this and as you run the core into it you would expect to see I can blow this up you would expect to see the marine deposits on top you would expect to see the river deposits below and this would be the shell midden that's how it would occur in your mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. core so you can already envision what this will look like before you get out there and see it and I think that's very critical and I teach my students to spend time and write and draw things to sort of elaborate in their mind's eye. Because archaeology in particular is a big exercise in pattern matching. Mm -hmm. You need to understand what things will look like in the past and then when you do find them in the field how to recognize them. So from the cross section we're looking uh, now not so much in the channel but as the gradient of the channel goes down we might see that there are situations where there are deposits that are sort of lapped onto the edge of the ancient landscape. So I'm just going to put a, I'm just going to put a tree here as if okay. that was the actual high and dry part. Um, and this might be, you know, 16,000 years, and then this was 18, and this was 20, and at all these, and this is sort of the way it'll look as sea level's coming up. It's going to keep laying down deposits. Okay. And um, but we may actually see there are parts in this landscape where people actually spent time in an active estuary. Okay. So we have to sort of envision that this is a changing landscape. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, we've been running the sub bottom profiler. Yeah. So what, what are the profiles that we'd love to see right there on that sweet spot if we were able to get to it? Yeah, so what we have been seeing is that in some cases as sea level was coming up, it actually spent a little time, it could be centuries or so in a single spot. Okay. And what it'll actually do is cut wave cut notches okay. into the slope cool. and then as it goes up. And so this could be your 20,000 year right here. And yep. then sea level kept rising yep. to this position. And then it spent time here and cut it at 18,000 right. like this. And then as it kept coming up, it spent a little time there. So in certain situ situations where the geometry of the landscape is just right and the waves are going to cut, you'll actually mm -hmm. see these. And we, we observed these a couple times when we were doing our transects. Okay. So if these are wave cut notches, then um, in some situations, you know, the, the, it's not that steep necessarily. It's rising up and then it goes down and then it rises slowly and goes down. Yep. It goes up and then what we may see is that there are archaeological sites positioned on the back side of this you can sort of imagine it mm -hmm. as the tide is right in yep. here you want to be up a little bit away from there mm -hmm. people may situate themselves up away from the tide again when sea level gets higher yep so you sort of have to in your mind's eye be able to think about what the form of this landscape is and for me it's always easiest to make drawings